Hello and welcome to another episode of Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, where we are taking Black people into the future. When I started this show and we talk about Afrofuturism and so forth, one of the things that always comes up is the imagery and representation of Black people in various mediums, be it television, be it print, be it movies, comic books, and so forth. My guest today is, in my opinion, uh, I guess one of the pioneers in, in many ways when it comes to representation and in positive imagery. I know that there are folks that have come before him, but I would definitely put him on the Mount Rushmore of Black creators in the realm of comic books. My guest today is Dawood Anyabwile. And Dawood is an Emmy Award-winning illustrator with over 25 years of experience as a graphic novel comic book artist, storyboard, and character background designer for television and film. He is also co-creator an illustrator of the critically acclaimed comic book series entitled Brother Man, Dictator of Discipline. And with that, I'd like to welcome Brother Dawu. How are you doing today? I'm good, brother. How are you feeling? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, like I shared with you before we uh, came on air, when I did this uh, program, you were one of the people that I definitely wanted to have on board. Because like I said, I think that when we talk about folks that are really behind and have been doing a good job from the beginning of representing Black people in a positive light, uh, you, you're at the top of the list for me. You know, today, folks will celebrate Marvel Comics or DC Comics or some other companies and so forth for their representation of Black people and say that, you know, they're, they're showing such positive imagery. But there's also a check and pass there when they weren't doing such a good job. And I think it's important that we recognize people that were doing a good job from the beginning. And you're one of those people. So once again, thank you for being part of this show today. I give thanks, I'm glad to be here. Um, can you talk to us about how you got started on your journey to becoming this acclaimed artist and creator? You know, uh, did it start with Brother Man? Did the story begin further back? Can you walk us through that, please? Uh, yeah, the, the story definitely goes back further, I usually try to consolidate it because it's really a lifetime of work. You know, like you have, like think of like most musicians out there who, who you know, they may come out with a hit song or an actor who just landed a blockbuster movie. And to us, they came out yesterday, but for them, they've been on that journey pretty much their whole life. You know, like going to after school dance classes or acting classes, singing classes, you know, probably having those opportunities that probably happened 20 years ago that seemed like it was going to be their big break and then it fell through. And then they tried again and it fell through. And then maybe years later, something happens. And then that's the thing that blew up. But for us, it's new. But for them, it was a, a journey of a lifetime, you know, and, then, and it continues even after what we know them for. So with me, you know, I can go back several different stages in my life you know like brother man was just one stage but prior to that going back to the 80s uh i was an airbrush artist at the mall in philly um during that you know that golden era of hip hop you know like the 80 83 84 85 era right and and you know and prior to that you know i was a, a fine arts major all through high school and then just going back to elementary school and before then I just always knew art was something I wanted to do. I always knew that doing art, representing, and not saying like, you know, it was always a deep thing, but I think it's through my parents since I was young. You know, I remember my mom saying to me, you know, it's not just about being a good artist. Like, what story are you telling? How, what are you representing? Even when I didn't fully understand what she's talking about when I was younger, apparently those words still stuck because, you know, my, my mother passed away in 94, but I still quote her words. 
right. from childhood. That that's the impact that it had. So you know the, those those things manifest through different stages. So even during the hip hop era in the mid '80s, when I was getting into like the whole uh, airbrushing and you know the graffiti era, you know like when I was in high school, I went to high school. You know there was a lot of uh, other graffiti writers and right. illustrators and artists, and I was all into it. You know I was into the DJ and I was into like the uh, the graffiti styles and and even the the difference between the styles in Philly and the New York styles, because I, right. I was between both places. And I always saw like a convergence of that with fine art, with also our culture and telling our stories. And um, and then it was also working with family because brother man, I didn't do it by myself. It was a it was a family venture. Cause you know, my, my brother Guy was writing, my other brother Jason was doing the uh, production management and handling the distribution so everybody can focus on each thing that we're doing. But even that goes back to my father who emphasized the family. Always, he always emphasized, uh, actually he wrote books on the black family um, through his company called BFR Publications, Black Family Rituals. And he had that since the early seventies, like a rites of passage program for black right. youth, a marriage ceremony called the Indoi, Indoa Eusi, uh, Umoja Karamu, which is a unity feast, which basically sim similar to Kwanzaa, it's, it's, it's celebrated around the time of Thanksgiving when we're all going to come together as a family. But if we're going to come together, why don't we come together and reflect on our culture and our history? You know, right. let's celebrate right. us during that time. So he was big on uh, us having ceremony and, um, you know, new traditions and ceremonies that represent who we are. And that came from things that he felt was lacking when he was growing up in Jersey City, you know. Um, and I, I didn't see all of these. I mean, I've, I, I've experienced these things coming up, but I think I got a better handle on it as I got, got older, understanding the things that my parents was, were teaching me and our extended family, like our uncles and aunts. Right. You know, we have a really big family and family was always emphasized. And that's why I found my joy with my cousins and my uncles and aunts and my friends and things like that. So to me, Brother Man was kind of like just the extension of all of that. It's like you're merging family, friends, hip hop, graffiti, um, children, you know, the love of children and creating a safe world for them and and things that are funky. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and like you're saying, the the the. The Afrofuturism, to me, that is creating your own world. So to me, right. Big City was that um, metaphorical place for us to live. Mm -hmm. So you're just creating all, you know, you're just creating what you want to see and you put it out there and let it be what it's going to be. And that's, that's why I said there's really no one um, starting point for Brother Man. It was a convergence of a whole lot of different uh, I say uh, points right. that came together. Now, what I like is the fact that you're talking about uh, family coming together because all too often, you know, we hear don't go into business with family and so forth. And I'm always telling people, you know, when you look at some of the wealthiest uh, groups or institutions around the globe, yeah. they're all families. The families, right? Yeah. So why are we discouraging family within our own community? So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Now, when you created Brother Man. Uh, was this something that was always done independently? Did you try to sell to other companies? Or like I said, was this something you just wanted to do on your own with your family, your own company from the beginning? It, it, was, it was something that was organically grown through the family. It was never something intended for uh, a major institution. You know, like we never sold it to any, like we never created with the intention of, being discovered by a big company, you know, um, in the eighties, like I said, when I was airbrushing at the mall in Philly, that was a big deal during those times because a lot of people, airbrushing is a big thing now. It, it kind of, I, I would say though it had its really high point going into the nineties and the early two thousands. Now it's kind of more, you know, I, I think it's a, a um, it's the technique that's not going to die. 
Right. And it's out there, but it's now it's, it's something that, you know, it's commonplace. People have seen it, but it's still dope, depending on, you know, the artists that are doing it. Right. But when I was doing it, it was during a time when, what's that? Right. Hey, man, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And, and so you, you, you were doing the denim jackets? Denim jackets, yes. t- uh, the T-shirts, sweatshirt, yep. pants. Right. You know, but at the time I was doing it in Philly, especially at the mall, uh, it was called the Gallery Mall, which is the big, ma- well, it's, it's since shut down, but it was the big mall in Philly. And at one time, I think it was the largest inner city mall on the East Coast. And so, you know, when you go to Philly, you had to go to the gallery. That place was massive. And there was a T-shirt shop in there owned by this brother named Marshall Jackson. And I remember when I was like 19 years old, you know, going into the shop, showing him a shirt that uh, I did one shirt that a friend of mine, he put me on in terms of like the, the equipment when I was in Jersey. So I just showed him the shirt and he said, OK, I'm going I'm to give you a chance and set you up at the in the food court. And the following week, he said I could set up there and I didn't even have any equipment. I just wow. was we were just talking up a game to him. Like it was me and my friend. We, we went down there and uh, I said, hey, you want to make a million dollars? Let me airbrush some shirts in your shop. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't know how he was going <laughs> to respond. And he said, OK, I like this, you know, because at that time, the shirts that most of the kids were coming to get from around the city, they didn't have us on the shirts. Most of them were like. Warner Brothers shirts, right. you know, get a kitten, you know, like girls will come and get a kitten, um, heat pressed on their shirt. If you had a a, a rap crew or a, a break dancing crew, you'll get the Greek letters printed on your the arc of your back. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Um, yeah, yeah it, w- it was basically that. It wasn't like characters. It wasn't right. stuff that looked like us. So when I came in, I also had a unique style in terms of, Okay, I'll, I'll do y'all on a shirt. And it was kind of like the graffiti type characters, but I was doing my own thing with it, doing a lot of foreshortening. A lot of stuff you see in Brother Man, I was doing that style in the mall years before it was really popular. Gotcha. So a lot of people, they even accredited that they came to the mall and they were like uh, inspired by what I was doing. But I was meeting a lot of the graffiti writers all throughout the city while I was doing that and building camaraderie. And so just like I was inspiring them, they were inspiring me. So it was kind of like a symbiotic relationship uh, dealing with a lot of other street artists. And then I also dealt with fine artists. I was also into sci-fi. I was into like comic books. So uh, the one brother, uh, Reggie Byers, who did a, a comic called Shuriken, he did Kids of the King, Jam Quacky. Um, he was the first brother who I knew who actually was printing his own comics other than Dwayne Ferguson, who, who went on to do Captain Africa, but he started off with um, uh, Hamster Vice. Gotcha. And they were the only two brothers I knew who actually did comics, but Reggie was the one who actually walked me through, here's how you make a comic book. But back then it was like hard. It wasn't like, you know, you, didn't have, you don't have on-demand printing. You right. had to find an actual printer that had a web press and back then you had to get 10,000 books per print run, wow. you know, and then you got to Then you have to go through like diamond distributors. And at the time there was capital distributors. I think capital's gone. I think diamond's the only one that survived those years. And there was a third one. I forgot, but they, they shut down. Um, and that's what Reggie said. You, after you get your books printed, you get in the wizard guide and then you, you distribute to these comic book distributors who get them into the comic book stores. But when, uh, me and my brother started, we said, all right, well, let's do that, but let's not rely on the comic industry. Let's hit the black bookstores. Let's hit the black expos because the black expo just had just started in 89 in New York. And we went to see it and we said, oh, we need to be here set up. So by 1990, that's when Brother Man, the first issue came out and we introduced it at the black expo in 1990. And it just, it just took off right away because your audience is right there in front of you. Exactly. Thousands of black people because that was that was a big deal too. So it was like the convergence of like the perfect storm. Right. You got a black comic book, there's a black venue like Black Expo. You're dealing with something that's kind of like a, a the lack of black images in pop culture was like a food desert. Right. So you're coming in with some food. Got you see it. what I'm saying? So now with social media, we'll wake up in the morning. 
you know, look on the look on our phone and, you know, we see all the dopest black characters It's done by the illest artists and all that stuff. And, you know, that's the evolution, you know, that that's what you want to see. So that's cool. But but it's it's not the same as when when we wanted to experience dope graffiti and dope characters, we had to go where it was. We had to drive to New York to, to see the Graffiti Hall of Fame. We had to drive to certain parts, certain neighborhoods in Philly because somebody said, yo, this dude Raz, he got this dope piece down on the such and such train line. So you got to drive, you know, ride down yeah. to go see it. Now <laughs> yeah. you, just, you just look on your phone and you can see something in Germany. Right. But then you look at it for like five, you'll look at it for probably like 10 seconds, say that's dope, and then you'll scroll down to something else. So you're not really savoring it like we did when we were younger because you'll be down there taking pictures, posing in front of it, analyzing it, and then you go home and it's in your head. Right. So we, right. so things were like more, they were special, you know. Gotcha. DJing was special, block parties were special. And I'm not saying people don't think of things as special now. It's just to help the younger people who weren't there understand, uh, you know, that era, what what right. we were feeling during that time. Oh, no question. Yeah, it was different. It was definitely right. different. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, here on WOL 1450 AM, 95.9 FM. And you can also listen online at WOLDCnews.com, where information is power. And today we are joined by Dawood Anyabwele, and he's the creator of, among other things, Brother Man. Now, before we get into the other things, because I really want to talk about some, some of the stuff that you're doing currently, what's Brother Man about for the folks that don't know? Okay, Brother Man began as, well, you know, I'll say the, the, the story is about, and we always say the, the ongoing theme is a man battling social apathy in this fictitious city called Big City. Mm -hmm. So when we created Brother Man, you know, it was this all black universe. And even that, I wouldn't even say it was a conscious decision of, hey, I'm going to make a black comic book with black characters and um, it's going to star a black superhero or anything. You know, I, I don't even say I would think consciously like that because that's all that's what I was doing anyway since high school. Right. You know what I mean? I was always like edifying my cousins and the girls and it looked like my, my cousins or uh, girls in the class. And things like that and they're the stars and we, and it's almost like you wanted to imagine one day that i would make a book starring us so doing brother man was like okay well here's an opportunity to create a platform for our people in their own adventure so it's not it's it's not an ex it's not a conscious exclusion of anyone it's the it's the conscious reinforcement of what you would want to see, which is right. something about us. You know, just like, you know, if uh, uh, when uh, martial arts films come out, they're projecting their culture. Right. If you're in Lagos, Nigeria, they're gonna, they're gonna uh, push their, their culture. India, they're gonna push their culture. You know, right. but I think for black people in America, we have a, there's almost like this uh, guilt trip that's put on us that you can't create something about yourself. You have to add everybody else in or you're, or you're being um, exclusionary to everyone else because you're loving yourself. And I'm like, nah, man, I, I just make stuff about me because I, I always celebrate other people's stuff. Right. You know, I, don't worry about I don't worry about it if I'm not in uh, Five Fingers of Death. I right. want to know how they do. You don't have to put me in there to appease me. Show me how you do what you do. And then the way to create, when we talk about social unity or respecting each other's culture is by, okay, now I'm now expressing my culture. Now, how come you can't just support my thing? Like I've, I've been supporting your thing since I was a kid. I exactly. support all these cultures. But then when exactly. we come out with something, people try to regulate. Oh, you can't do this unless you add this. I said, now you, now you regulate my creativity. Right. <laughs> Right. I can't even imagine without you telling me how I have to imagine. Right. You know, you know what I'm saying? So so Brother Man was basically us creating that world. And in this world, Big City was kind of like a play off of, you know, since we grew up in Philly and Jersey City, which is basically right next to Manhattan, that was like our 
our second home because that's where my parents are from and my and my cousins and everything. So New York, Jersey, that was always like our second home. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like we saw how, you know, the, the environment was. And we said, well, let's have a story about this guy. He's he's in this city that was once the, the, the center of greatness, but it fell into decay through, um, you know, people jockeying for power, like people losing hope, people forgetting about the, uh, you know, the, 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 the forefathers who created it with um, principle. And right. all the principle, you know, people fell off a of principle. Now people are trying to do them whatever. So when you have this person who's trying to bring it back to his original greatness, they're going to face a lot of challenges and they realize they can't do it alone. So, so he doesn't have superpowers. So his powers are really his, his intellect, his drive to uh, stand on his square. Um, you know, to basically uh, deal with the apathetic, because basically right. it's those who don't care is the reason why the city falls into decay, because if people cared, it wouldn't it wouldn't be in that condition. So it was kind of like a play on that. But then also what we did was we created all these characters that were um, representative of ideologies, of character, character traits. Right. And it was timeless. We didn't we didn't deal with uh, current events. It's a fictitious city with their own rules, their own laws, their own currency, their own um, politics. So that becomes more timeless as opposed to a book from 1990 and or a book from the 80s where, oh, that wasn't the mayor right. of Philadelphia during that time. Well, it doesn't matter because this is not Philadelphia. This is not America. This is well, what I call now dream state mythology. Right. It's basically like a uh, when you experience things in reality and then you go to sleep, you see a skewed version of the subway system. You see a, a skewed version of, of your family. You, you right. see what I'm saying? Right. So, so you get the feeling and, and the, the, the soul of it all. So that, that's, that's kind of a, the underlying theme. And how can folks get a copy? How can they support you? How many, how many issues have you done and how can folks get a copy? Well, the original series ran from 1990 to 1996 is when the last of the original book came out, which was number 11. There were 11 of the original series. We did like basically 750,000 books during that period of time. But then the series stopped when my parents passed a year apart from each other. And then from 96 to man probably like 2009 is when we had the first brother man art show which was the resurgence of the series mm -hmm. because we came out with the the trade paperbacks which was a collection of all 11 books but then we ceased that in 2017 <laughs> so the graph the full color graphic novel which continued uh, after issue number 11, which was like the origin story of Brother Man, but it's really the first book of the origin. That came out in 2016. And if you go to uh, Big City Enter Big City Entertainment INC.com or Brother Man Comics.com, Brother Man C O M I C S dot com, you can get information and order the graphic novel, which will basically take you to Amazon. But right. if you're trying to find the original books, they're they're difficult to find. Right now, I'm not reprinting them. I plan to do it again. But you know, when we talk about the things going on now, Brother Man's pretty much been put on hold because there's a lot of other things I'm trying to do now. Right. So then when I bring Brother Man back, I don't want to bring it back in struggle mode. I'd rather bring it back when I, when it's on a whole nother level. Right. You see what I'm saying? I got you. <laughs> now uh we are up against it. Believe it or not, we're almost at the end of the show. And I do want to talk to you about the other things. You're doing some great things in addition to uh, Brother Man. So I want to bring you back for another conversation. Would you mind coming back? Hey, no doubt. Excellent. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Into the Afroverse. 
here on WOL 1450 AM, 95.9 FM, where information is power. You can also listen on WOLDCnews.com. And as always talk about, you know, uh, Black folks always talking about this positive imagery we want to see. We want to take control of our economics. We want to be able to build up our culture. We want to surround and protect that culture. And this is yet another example, another way in which we can do it. If you're paying attention, I don't know, unless you've been living under a rock, comic books, billion dollar industry, we need to be part of that. We're supporting it, but we also need to benefit from it. And here with Brother Dawood, uh, creator of Brother Man Comics, this is an example of a man that's been doing it the right way from the beginning, continues to do it, and we need to get out and support this man. So once again, we're into the Afroverse. I am your host, William Jones. You can join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. You're on WOL. Information is power. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Thank you, Doug. All right, thank you.